tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? In our last segment of Israel's future, according to Bible prophecy, we talked about many of the things that will occur as a result of the signing of this Middle East peace agreement. For example, the Temple Mount is going to be placed under a sharing arrangement. Jerusalem will remain under Israeli control during this seven-year interim period. Israel will build her third temple. Animal sacrifices will be resumed once the temple is completed. The Antichrist will stop the sacrifices after a while. There will be so many objections. This will set up what's called in the Bible the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist will stand on the Temple Mount claiming to be the ultimate authority there. Some people say he will even claim to be God. This event will start what's called the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation starts at the abomination of desolation and lasts for the next three and one half years. Now, Jesus picked it up there in Matthew 24, verse number 16 through 18. He talked about the abomination in verse 15. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, which of course is on the Temple Mount, then Jesus said, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. If you live out in the West Bank under Palestinian control, let him which is on the housetop don't even come down into your house to grab your things. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Something about the abomination of desolation is going to trigger Palestinian anger, and they will launch a horrible slaughter against the Jewish people living in Judea. We must warn the Jews of Judea that they are going to have to flee. And that's the reason why we're doing so many things here at End Time Ministries to warn them. Now, the scriptures tell us that when they run for their lives, some of them are going to escape, undoubtedly the ones that receive the warning and obey it. Others of them will not pay any attention because the warning comes from the mouth of Jesus. Since it's a New Testament prophecy, some of them are going to ignore it. Some of them are not. We're going to do our best some way, somehow, to convince them to at least take the warning halfway seriously, enough to escape until they see. Now, here's what's going to happen. When these Jews of Judea run for their life, they're going to look over their shoulder and see their brethren perishing. They're going to see them being slaughtered. That's when it's going to dawn on them that the prophecy of Jesus of Matthew 24 just now saved my life. Now, we're going to tell them in the magazine, we're going to send out to every home in Israel, when you run for your life, get to Jerusalem, and we will meet you there. When they come there, we're going to tell them where to come to. We're going to then say, Jesus just saved your physical life. Let us tell you about eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us, and we had all this planned, and I came across a scripture in Zechariah 12, 7 that just amazed me because everything I thought was going to happen, this confirms it. Listen to Zechariah 12, 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. Now we know all of Israel is going to ultimately be saved. The scripture teaches us that very clearly when Messiah comes back at Armageddon, all that survived the great tribulation, the wrath of God, will be saved at that time. But this passage says the Lord will save the tents of Judah first, the people living in Judea, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Now, why does it say this? Why does it say, lest the inhabitants of Jerusalem magnify themselves against Judah. Well, here's the reason. Many of the people living in Israel proper look down their noses at the settlers. They see them as religious extremists, as religious rednecks, and they say if it wasn't for these uh, settlers, we could have favor with the world community. They are standing between us and peace. 
they are endangering the state of Israel. That's what people actually believe. Consequently, God said, hey, they went out and they tried to obey me because I told you when I bring you into the land that I promised your father Abraham, you are to occupy the land. They did that. True, it's not working out right now. But because they did their best to do what is right, I'll just save the tents of Judah first, lest you think you're better than those people that went out there and established those settlements and attempted to obey what I have told them to do. Now, the Bible tells us that at this particular time, another event happens in heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 14 records a war that will take place between the angels of God and the angels of Satan. Now, if you don't believe in God and you don't believe in Satan, this will mean nothing to you. But it records this war. It's apparently Satan's last-ditch effort to overthrow God and to usurp his place and to take the worship that belongs only to God for himself. Well, when he attempts this, the Bible says, Michael and his angels will make war against Satan and his angels. Satan's angels will be defeated, and their punishment will be they will be confined to the earth from that time forward. Now, prior to this, Satan has access to heaven. The Bible says he can appear before God. He accuses the brethren. For example, as he did in the days of Job, he appeared before God and said, Job doesn't serve you for nothing. He only serves you because you bless him so much. Well, when he is cast down, the Bible says, uh, Woe be to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which did accuse them before God day and night. Now, when Satan sees that he's defeated, he knows that he's only got three and a half years left before he goes to the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So he has nothing to lose. When he sees that he is cast down, the Bible says that he will make war against the woman and the remnant of her seed. And the Bible says, the woman here is described as Israel. She has 12 stars about her head. And the Bible tells us that when Satan makes war against Israel, that there will be given to the woman Israel two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, what's this eagle? When Israel runs from the world governmental powers of the Antichrist, who's going to help her? Well, there happens to be a nation on earth today whose symbol is the eagle. We taught that in the first segment of this lesson, the United States of America. And even though this was written 2,000 years ago, the nation whose symbol is the eagle just happens to be Israel's best friend in the world. So the Bible says there will be given to her two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place. Now, a lot of theories are out there saying Israel's going to run down to Petra in southern Jordan, and that's where she's going to be safe. That's the most dangerous place in the world. One bomb in the middle of Petra kills everybody there if you've ever been there. It is a death trap. It was a wonderful fortress back in the days of horses and, and footmen. But today, in the days of airplane, it is a death trap. The Bible tells us right here where Israel is going to run to. It says, she will run into her place. Where is her place? It's her promised land. She's going to be right there in the nation of Israel. And she's going to be protected from the world government and the Antichrist for time, times, and have a time. That's exactly what it says here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. Now, to those of us who live in the United States, that's good news because we're worried about our government right now and some of the pressure they've been willing to place on our, one of our very best friends, Israel. So it appears that someone will be in our government that will befriend Israel all the way to the end, and she's going to be protected during that time. To show you that Israel will never fall under the power of the Antichrist, the Antichrist attempts to invade Israel for the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the seven-year period. You don't try to invade a place if you already control it. So Israel is not going to be under control of the Antichrist all during the final three and a half years, but Israel is going to be in a protected status. Furthermore, the country of Jordan, America's other best friend in the Middle East, is also going to be protected because Daniel 11 41 says, the children of Edom, Moab, and Ammon shall escape out of his hand. Edom is southern Jordan, the Moab mountains are in central Jordan, and Abon Jordan is the capital of Jordan. So the Bible tells us that that's what's going to happen. Okay, 
Now, since the Lord said, I will save the tents of Judah first, we need to be preparing for the coming revival. The revival to Israel is coming in two waves. One of them will happen halfway through the final seven years. And that's when the revival will happen to Judah. I will save the tents of Judah first, Zechariah 12, 7. We are presently teaching the prophecies of the Bible in Israel several times a week, every week on television. Furthermore, we're establishing the Jerusalem Prophecy College. By the time you see this program, it will be a done deal. November the 2nd, 2013, we're opening the Jerusalem Prophecy College. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want the Jewish people to know what's coming. The sons of Issachar were men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. You can't know what to do if you don't know what time it is, if you are not prophetically literate and aware. And we intend to make sure that anyone who will pay attention will understand what the Bible says is coming. We're going to publish it so many ways. And of course, one of the master strokes we're hoping to do is to send a magazine to every single home in Israel the month the final seven years began. We want a magazine explaining the whole thing to go to every single home in Israel. I believe when that happens, many of the homes in Israel will receive it. Some of them will reject it. But not only will they receive it, but it will reverberate around the world when the world hears of this effort that's coming. Okay, what happens then at the end of the seven years? Zechariah 14, 2 tells us explicitly, God said, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. What's going to trigger this? Well, we're going to reach the end of this interim agreement, the seven-year agreement. At that time, Israel is still going to say, we're not leaving Jerusalem. We can't do it. That's the city that God chose to place his name there. So the world community is probably going to pass resolutions against Israel at the United Nations, and they're going to issue resolutions. You must withdraw from East Jerusalem. You must turn that over to the Palestinians for their capital. Whoever is going to be the prime minister of Israel at the time is going to say, we just cannot do it. We will not do it. And that's when all, a world peacekeeping force, a world army is going to come down to enforce the rev resolution of the United Nations against the tiny state of Israel. Now notice something. The passage says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The UN and the world community is going to think it's their idea. The Antichrist is going to think it's his idea. We're going to teach the smart aleck Israel that refuses to bow the knee to the world governmental system. We're going to teach them a lesson. And they're going to say, we're going to go down against Jerusalem. But God said, I'm going to gather them down. God's going to say, come on down. Make my day. I'm going to show you what happens when you fight against my decrees. I said, this land belongs to Israel and you're trying to pervert that. And I am going to settle the case with you. And the Bible says that during the battle of Armageddon, it'll undoubtedly start in the north in the plain of Megiddo, sweep all the way down the Jordan Valley. And finally, Israel is falling backwards under the superior firepower of the United Nations and the world government armies. The Israeli soldiers are fighting valiantly, but now then, the world government forces are closing in on their capital, the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible says, even half of Jerusalem will go into captivity. Here Israel is fighting for her life. However, now she's teetering on the brink of defeat. Maybe Ahmadinejad is right. Maybe Israel is going to be wiped off the map as Israel makes her last stand. I can imagine those young Jewish soldiers, their mothers have taught them, when we need him the most, Messiah will come. And I just imagine as they look down in their ammunition boxes and see they're on their last round, they know that it's about over. And they lift their eyes to the Mount of Olives. They've been told this is where the Messiah is coming to. He's coming to the Mount of Olives. It says it in Zechariah 14. So 
They're going to say, Messiah, if you're ever going to come right now, would be a wonderful time. Zechariah 14, 3 says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Almighty God, Messiah, is going to come, intervene for the Jewish people, and fight for them. The scriptures tell us that he will place his feet on the Mount of Olives. Now, Zechariah 13, 6 says this is what is going to happen because when Messiah shows up, well, he's going to have wounds in his hands. Here it is from the Jewish scriptures, Zechariah 13, 6. And one will say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? then he will say, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friend. And the Jewish people that have run out to, their, to meet their Messiah to the Mount of Olives, and they're, they're going to know he's come. He's coming in the sky. It's going to be a stupendous event. They're going to rush out to meet him. And when they fall to worship him, Zechariah 13, 6 says, they'll notice he's got these scars in his hands and in his feet. And they're going to say, Where'd you get these wounds? And according to Zechariah 13, 6, he will say, these are they with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And all of a sudden, the blindness is going to come off of the eyes of those wonderful Jewish people. And they're going to say, so you're Jesus. And he's going to say, I'm Jesus. And they're going to bow before him in humble repentance. Oh, Messiah, could you ever Forgive us. We've been so stubborn. We've been so blind. Thank you for coming to save us. Well, does anyone know what happens when someone asks Jesus to forgive them? He forgives them. Well, that's what's going to happen at that particular moment, right there on the Mount of Olives. And fortunately, those of us who are born again will have the privilege of being behind Jesus, watching the whole drama unfold. Well, then... The scriptures tell us in Revelation 19, 19 through 20, that the Antichrist, the false prophet, will be destroyed. Listen to it. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies, the world government armies of the United Nations, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. There will be two personages leading the world government in the end time. A political leader called the Antichrist, a spiritual leader called the false prophet. They will be in alliance together as they lead the world into this one world utopian society that they hope to establish. So the Antichrist, the false prophet will come. The false prophet will actually have wrought miracles in, before the Antichrist. And the Bible says in one place that he actually will have pulled down fire from heaven in the sight of men. He's going to influence the masses to give their allegiance to the Antichrist and his one world government. The Bible says that uh, the miracles will be used to deceive them that receive the mark of the beast, them that worshiped his image. The Bible says that Almighty God, Jesus Christ, will then cast both of them alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. But it doesn't stop there. Continue right on the next verse, verse chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be finished. We are looking right now at the scripture that talks about the dethroning of Satan, the putting away of Satan, and the crowning of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. Can you imagine 1,000 years without a devil? Not one war. For a thousand years, the Bible says in that day that the wolf and the lamb shall lie down together. The cow will eat straw with the bear. There will be nothing that hurts nor destroys. Meeting animals will no longer be meeting animals. They will eat straw like the cow does, the bear will. 
God's going to transform this whole thing and there will be peace on earth. The Bible tells us that men will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, and men won't even learn war anymore. They're going to dissolve all the militaries. The earth is going to experience massive disarmament and there won't even be military training in the nations. Men will learn war no more. What a day that's going to be. Not one war for 1,000 years. Why? Because the Prince of Peace has come. He has come to teach us the way of peace. Uh, Jesus said the way of peace they have not known. But he came to this earth to teach us the way of peace. He did it in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes. He said no matter of laws is going to bring you peace. There has to be a transformation of the heart. And he taught us there in Matthew chapter 5, uh, the way to peace. He said, if someone hates you, the proper response is to love them. If someone curses you, you are to bless them. If someone despitefully uses you, you're to do something good to them. How are you doing with this? I mean, this is the way to peace. This is what Jesus came to this earth to teach all of us. Pray for those that despitefully use you. Bless those that curse you. If someone is working against you on the job, trying to get your job, undermining your reputation to the boss, what's your response going to be to that? Is it to go say something nice about that person to the boss? That's what Jesus taught us to do. It's opposite of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth because all that does is you bomb me, I bomb you bigger, and everything escalates out of control. But if I hate you and you love me in return, all of a sudden I realize how dirty my hate is. And all of a sudden I realize there's a better way. I mean, this will solve your marital problems. It'll solve your problems with your children. It'll solve the problems in your business. This is what's going to happen during this 1,000 years when Jesus reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. Okay, let's look at the final chapter. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. When Messiah comes, he will come and he will defeat the armies of the Antichrist. He is going to execute judgment on those that have rejected his rulership, on those that have come down to try to destroy the Israeli people. He is going to execute his judgment. The Bible says that blood will flow to the horse bridles. And as he comes down here, he's going to judge, he's going to make war, do away with the Antichrist, do away with the false prophet, and at that same time, he will turn to those that love him, and they will crown him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you imagine that final coronation? Can you imagine once the Antichrist, the false prophet, go to the lake of fire, once Satan is bound for a thousand years, can you imagine as all of a sudden, we who love him, gather around. The Bible says that we will throw our crowns at his feet. Yes, we're going to receive a crown. I never liked that in the Bible, but because I didn't think I was worthy to have a crown, but I've changed my mind. I want one because I believe with all my heart, I will be able to take my crown, which I do not deserve, and throw it at the feet of him who does deserve it. King of kings, Lord of lords. At that time, we're going to have this marvelous coronation ceremony. What a privilege this is going to be when all war ceases, all animosity ceases, and instead of strife, there's going to be harmony. It's going to be a new age when Jesus Christ will rule this world as King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me say something to all of you out there. You don't have to wait until that time to be a part of this because the Bible tells us we can enter the kingdom of God now. Jesus said, except a person is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can be born again, and you can tap right into this right now. 
We have a brochure here at End Time Ministries that I would love to give you free of charge. It's called, What Do You Mean Born Again? The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. Well, that's what Jesus wants you to have. Call us today, 1-800-END-TIME, or go to endtime.com. Hi, Judy and I will be leading our End Time Prophecy Tour to the Holy Land on October 27th to November the 7th of 2016. We want to invite you to go with us on this 12-day life-changing tour. After one of our recent tours, one man said he no longer reads his Bible in black and white, but now in color and in 3D. Not only will you stand on the Temple Mount, visit the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem, and stand in the tomb where Jesus spent three days and three nights, but you will also walk through the places that will soon witness some of the greatest prophetic fulfillments of all time. You will actually stand on the place where Jesus will stand when He returns to this earth. Words simply cannot do justice to these amazing experiences. To learn how you can join us, simply call us at 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363. 8463. Our 14 lessons now include the United States discovered in the Bible, New World Order is World Government, Islam in Bible Prophecy, World War III, Israel's God given destiny, Israel, God's prophetic time clock, Holy Roman Empire reborn, Antichrist and the False Prophet. 666 Mark of the Beast, the secret pact between Gorbachev and the Vatican, when all religions become one, the seven trumpets, the second coming, and the kingdom of God established on earth. You want to have all 14 of these marvelous prophecy lessons. If you go through these 14 DVDs, each of them one hour, you are going to know more about Bible prophecy than the average student graduating from theological seminary. We need to know where we are right now. Jesus Christ said, I tell you these things before they come to pass, so that when they do come to pass, you might believe. So the number to call is, one more time, 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463, or go to endtime.com. Join Irvin Baxter in Lufkin, Texas on September 10th and 11th, in Indianapolis, Indiana on September 23rd, and in South Bend, Indiana on September 24th. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com events for more information. 